Take your Bibles this evening, for, if you would please, and go to Revelation chapter 14, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. We have just one verse of scripture to read together this evening, verse number 13. Revelation 14, just one verse, verse 13. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to please, please to read God's word. And let's begin together and read verse 13 in unison. Ready? And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music we've had tonight. And, Lord, we've enjoyed all of it. Enjoy the fellowship of the people of God in this place. And, Lord, we're asking you now that you would continue to make us ready, that we'd be able to receive your Word, that our hearts would be good soil, that the Word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit. Lord, I pray your blessing on the special as it's sung, and I pray, Lord, that it would put our heart in tune with your heart tonight. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for 
again, the opportunity we have to open your word and look into it tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word for us, that we hold copies of it in our hand this evening. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight to receive it, not as the words of a man or the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And Lord, I ask you to help everyone to give their careful attention this evening. I pray you'd help me as I bring the truth tonight that I'll say what needs to be said in the way it ought to be said. And that, Holy Spirit of God, you would do a work in each one of our hearts that only you can do. Please move up and down these aisles, in and out of these rows, and, and speak to every person in attendance here this evening. I pray each one of us would, the best we know how, yield ourselves to you right now. That we'd listen carefully to the still, small voice of your Spirit. And Lord, we'd have ears to hear what you'd want to say to each of us this evening through your word. Lord, bless this time together, these next few moments, in Jesus' name, amen. If you take your Bible, I'd like you to turn over to Luke 15 with me. I'm I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12. I want to look at a parable that Jesus told that kind of ties in with our text verse in Revelation 14. Luke chapter 12, if you will. You're very familiar with this parable. Jesus begins it in Luke 12 in verse number... 16, actually to set the stage for it, look with me at verse 15, would you please? Verse 15, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Okay? Uh, Whoever dies with the most toys doesn't win. Okay? In fact, the one who has the most toys isn't even happy. Okay? Okay? And uh, that's what Jesus is saying. Now notice what he, how he illustrates this with this parable. He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I want you to look at this rich fool for a moment and see how he left God out of everything. He left God out of his thoughts. He left God out of his business. He left God out of his years. And he left God out of his soul. Did you notice as as he brought forth plentifully and he, he had much, he thought within himself, There's a great difference between thinking to yourself and praying to God. God's not in his thoughts here. He's just having a conversation with himself. What should I do? Did you notice as you read through here how many I's there were? Well, I do this, I'll do that, I do this. And how many my's there were? My fruit, my goods, my soul. My, 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 I, I, I. It was all about him. And God said that man was foolish. Foolish to live that way. And he spends eternity in hell tonight. I know, we, we, listen, we look at this guy, we read about it, and we say, well, man, preacher, I'd never do that. I, I'd never be that guy. I, I've never, I'd never get, get like that. But so often, isn't it true that so often our thoughts, our desires, our plans all center around ourselves? We're so prone to be selfish and so prone to be self-centered. Often in our business, it's about the paycheck or it's about problems on the job or problems with people we work with. So often our years about planning the future are without really asking God about anything. We talk, about, talk to our financial counselors or we'll talk to our brokers or we'll, talk to our, uh, we'll, we'll sharpen our own pencils and try to figure it out, but we very rarely just... Ask God what He wants. And what God, what, what are, where are you in our plans? You see, we're talking about, and, and I'm not talking about folks who don't know God. I'm talking about folks who 
say that they're born again. I'll talk about people who say, I know Christ is my Savior. But they do not include God in their thoughts. They do not include God in their business. They do not include God in their plans. I'm saying people who are saved by His blood and they, they breathe His air and we walk on God's earth and we drink His water. And yet other than Sunday or going to church, we go through our life and really don't give much thought to God. And don't give much thought to His Word and much thought to His will. I think what, I'm, what I want to impress upon you this evening in, in tying in with Revelation 14, 13, where it says they rest from their labors and their works do follow them, is don't live and die and not serve Jesus Christ. Don't, don't live and die and never lead another soul to Jesus Christ. Don't, don't live and die and never know what it's like to stand up and teach a Sunday school class. Don't, don't live and die and never know what it's like to ride a Sunday school bus to church on Sunday. Don't, don't live and die and never know what it's like to, to go to a nursing home and hold a church service like the folks did this afternoon. And, and, and 30 people there, by the way, to be blessed by the service. Don't, don't live and die and never know what it is to take care of a little one in the nursery. Or don't live and die and never know what it is to sing in a church choir. Oh, my friend, don't, don't live and die and never know what it is to serve Jesus Christ with your life. That's a wasted life. Somebody says, well, pastor, I'm saved. That's all that matters. I got a, I got a question. If... If that's all that matters, I saw it the other day on social media. Somebody said, when it really boils down to it, the only thing that matters is that you know Christ is your Savior. Now, I agree, when it comes to going to heaven or going to hell, that's the only thing that matters, is that you know Christ. But that's not all that matters. If that's all that matters, why is there a judgment seat of Christ? Why is there a judgment that says, that we're going to be judged on how we built on the foundation. The foundation is who? Jesus Christ. We have the foundation. That means you are saved. You have the foundation. But he, God says you're going to be, each of us are going to be judged on how we built upon that foundation. And so evidently, God doesn't see that just being saved is all that matters. Uh, apparently, how we build on that foundation after salvation is important to God. And He is going to reward us or we'll have things burnt up by fire. Now, <clears throat> look at some scripture with me, will you please? Get your Bible ready. Let's start in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I hope you have your Bible with you. <clears throat> the, the name of the church is Bible Baptist Church. And uh, that means you should have your Bible with you, amen? Ephesians chapter 2. And by the way, it isn't cell phone Baptist. So have your Bible with you. Notice, now we're, we're very familiar with verses 8 and 9, are we not? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. <clears throat> it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But now notice verse 10. For we are His workmanship... Created in Christ Jesus unto what? What's the words? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What's them? The good works. The good works. God says, you were created in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You were created in Christ Jesus unto good works exactly what Ephesians says. You were saved so you might do the works that God planned for you to do. There's works that God has ordained that you should walk in them. That's what you were saved for. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Again, familiar verse, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all... All what? Good works. 
The Word of God is given to us so we can be furnished, so we can be equipped, so we can do all good works. Okay? Understand. I'm, I'm to be doing good works. I'm created. I'm saved to do good works. Look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2 and verse 13, the Bible says we're to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Here, the Bible says Jesus gave Himself for us so He could redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto Himself a peculiar people. He gave Himself for us that we might be zealous of good works. Zealous is enthusiastic. Man, zealous is passionate about good works for the Lord Jesus. So we're saved and ordained unto good works. We are furnished unto good works. We're to be zealous of good works. I want you to look at Titus chapter 3. Notice Titus 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. You believe in God. You say, I believe in God. That's all that matters. No, I'm to constantly affirm to you that you who believe in God maintain good works. Okay? I think it's getting pretty clear, isn't it? Now, look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We know about the not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together in verse 25, but would you back up just one verse there? Look at Hebrews 10 and verse 24, <clears throat> where the Bible says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to, what church? Good works. So we are to provoke unto love and to good works. What I'm doing tonight is provoking you unto good works. Okay? Why? Your works will follow you. That's what Revelation 14, 13 tells us. They, these folks died, and he says they rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And, and you think, okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, I think it means several things. Number one, I believe their works do follow them means that what I do for Christ will be remembered. What I do for Jesus Christ will be remembered. <clears throat> you remember the story in uh, Mark chapter 2? of a paralyzed man and he had four friends who wanted to get him to Jesus and they, they carried him on the stretcher and when they got to where Jesus was there was such a crowd around the house they couldn't even get close <clears throat> and you, <clears throat> excuse me remember reading the story so they turned around and went home oh oh they didn't turn around and go home they didn't get discouraged oh no they, they went up the side of the house they got up on the roof and what'd they do yeah, they tore the roof up, tore a hole in the roof enough to let that guy down through the roof. And, and the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, not just the faith of the man who they're letting down through the hole, but the faith of those other four guys. Hey, I, let me ask you a question. Uh, who can name those four guys for me? Oh, their names weren't mentioned. Well, well, we know what kind of jobs they did. We know what kind of jobs they held. No, we don't. Well, well, I, I, know, I know what kind of neighborhood they lived in. Huh. Well, I, I know, I, I kind of know what kind of class of people they were. Don't we know that? Huh. We don't, we don't know what their income was, do we? How much money did they make in a year? What kind of home did they live in? We, we, we don't know anything else about what. What do we know about those men? All we know about those men is what they did for Jesus Christ. What they, they, got their man, they got their friend to Jesus and they got in the Bible because of that. Isn't that amazing? Their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman is a great captain of the hosts of Syria, the army. Naaman has contracted leprosy. Leprosy is fatal in those days. You did not live. It was a death sentence. 
And his wife had a little slave girl, a maid, the Bible calls her, who just was ministering to Naaman's wife. And she tells her, there's a man of God in Israel who could cure your master of his leprosy. She goes and tells Naaman. Naaman goes to see Elisha. And that's the story of gold dipping the Jordan River seven times, remember? And Naaman got mad, didn't want to do it, but eventually he does it, and guess what? He's cured of his leprosy. It works. Yeah, and that, that, that little girl's name, she, she was... God know you don't know her name, do you? Well, well, you know who her parents were. Well, you know what kind of family she came from. Huh. We don't know anything else about that little girl. Well, well we do know what kind of grades she got in school. Well, I know she was popular. She had lots of friends. Huh. None of that matters, does it? Why do we, why do we know about her? Because she told her master, there's a, prophet, there's a prophet, there's a man of God in Israel who could heal your leprosy. Her works do follow her. Her works do follow her. It's kind of like that boy in the New Testament who said, Jesus, you can have my lunch. Hmm? Actually, he said it to one of the disciples. <clears throat> and, and Jesus took those five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men besides women and children. Could have been easily been 10,000 people there that he fed with that lunch of that little boy. Of course, we know how old he was. We, we, we know his name, of course. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Well, we know his, who his parents were, don't we? Uh, it wasn't important either, was it? Well, we know what size he was. Well, I'm sure he had Nike sandals. Oh, he didn't. We don't know. We don't know anything else about this boy except what? What he gave to Jesus. And we still talk about him tonight because his works do follow him. We know Peter the Apostle. We don't know Peter the famous fisherman. We know John the Apostle. We don't know John the famous fisherman. We know Matthew the Apostle, not Matthew the tax collector. We know them because they followed Jesus Christ. What they did for Jesus Christ. Bob, you spent 30 years at Sigma? 31 years at Sigma. You've been retired now for three years. That probably they'll go all day tomorrow and not even think about Bob Wallace. 31 years of his life he invested there. 40, sometimes plus hours a week. Hasn't been gone three years and he's not going to be discussed in the lunchroom tomorrow. Not going to be talked about. No, you know what they did? Bob's retiring. Hey, uh, see you later. Here's a jacket. Have a good retirement. And you know what they did? They put someone else in his slot, and the next truck that came in the next time, he was in there doing what Bob Wallace was doing. And you're forgotten. Hey, it's no different, at, it's no different in your factory. And it's no different in your shop. And it's no different at your office. And it's no different at your construction site. It'll be no different. But you know what's going to be remembered? They remember every class of boys he taught Sunday school for the last 30 years. What will be remembered is not the work you did at the office or the work you did in the construction site, but what will be remembered is every song that you sing in the choir, every track you pass out telling somebody about Jesus, every time you changed a little baby's diaper in the nursery, every time you helped out in children's church and you sang chorus or you did a memory verse, every time you climbed on the church bus and rode the church bus, <coughs> every time you went to the nursing home and took care of some elderly folk and sang some songs to them and preached the Word of God to them. Listen, those things that you do for Christ are always going to be remembered. They're never forgotten. You say, well, nobody knows what I did. Yeah, but God knows what you did. And God takes note. Your works do follow you. I think the devil loves to get us to spend our time doing those things that do not matter 
for eternity. He loves to get us focused on things that just aren't going to matter when we get to heaven. And if the devil can't, and if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And you'll be busy doing things that just don't matter. And they won't matter at all a few seconds after you die. It would be great to have some Christians to say, my business is to serve God. My business is to live for God. My business, as Jesus said, is to be about my Father's business. And everything I do, every day I live, not on Sunday, not just Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, every day, because I realize that it's only what I do for Christ that's going to be remembered. The other stuff's going to fall away. What I do for Christ will be remembered. It means, number two, that I must not judge others. I must not judge others. You know, we mentioned those four men who got that paralyzed friend to Jesus. Do you remember when, when they were going up through there and, and they kind of uh, they, they went up to break the roof up, people complained. People criticized them. They, 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 they had some opposition. I'm sure as they walked past the crowd, I, there had to be people or people. They're just like people today, aren't they? Don't you think there had to be somebody in the line who said, hey, hey, the end of the line's back there. The line's back there. And they just kept walking. And watched them go up those steps at the side of the house and get up on the roof. And I'm sure they thought, hey, what are you doing? Get off of there. You don't belong up there. They didn't pay any attention. They just, they just kept right on going. They just kept right on and got their friend to Jesus. There's always people who will criticize the ones who are trying to do something for God. Don't be one of those people. John 21. Look at John chapter 21. Will you turn there please? John 21, Jesus has appeared to the disciples. He's appearing to Peter who has backslidden and taken fellows with him. And any time you backslide, you influence others to go with you. And Peter did that. They went out fishing and didn't catch anything. And Jesus comes and stands on the shore and asks them if they caught anything. And of course they had to be honest and say no. And then he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the ship and and they'll find, and of course they couldn't draw it to the land for the multitude of fishes, and boy, that all seemed awful familiar to the disciples, and then they knew this, this is who this is, this is Jesus. And of course they all came to the shore, and verse 9 says they had a fire of coals, and fish laid their own, and bread, and uh, Jesus said, bring me the fish which you've caught, and uh, then uh, they all knew it was the Lord, and this is the third time he shows himself. And then, of course, he asks Simon Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? And then he tells Peter that how he's going to die in verse 18. He says, Peter, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him two words. What are they? Follow me. Now, that's interesting, wouldn't it? That he would talk about how you're going to die for me, and uh, this is how your death is going to happen. Now, I just want to remind you, Peter, two, two simple words. Follow me. Okay? He barely gets the me out of his mouth, and notice what Peter says. Peter turns about. <clears throat> and a disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper. That, who is that disciple, by the way? That's John. And what does Peter say? Lord, uh, it, the same that said on his breast and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Now, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus just say, follow me? And Peter turns and looks at John. What, what is it about follow me didn't he get? Something. Well, Jesus is going to take care of that right now. Notice what Jesus said to him. 
Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And, and it's not here in English. You have to dig deep to get this. But Jesus said, Peter, read my lips. And I'm kidding. That's not in there. But he said, follow thou me. See, Peter got all concerned about what Jesus was going to do with somebody else. Jesus made it pretty clear here, that's none of your business. Whatever I do with John is up to me and John. It has nothing to do with you. You're following me. Don't, don't get so concerned about somebody else. How often have you caught yourself looking at another Christian and saying, well, I don't think they should be. Or why are they doing? Or how come I'm here doing this and no one else is? And we get all worried about everybody else. What someone else is doing or what someone else isn't doing. And we begin to get the Peter syndrome here. Jesus would kindly and sweetly tell you, that's none of your business. Follow thou me. Follow thou me. See, our job is not to make sure others are doing what they should do or what we think they should do. Our job is to make sure we're doing what God tells us to do. That am I doing what I'm supposed to do in the sight of God? See, we can never, we can never pass judgment on another believer because we don't know the whole story. Why? Man looks on the outward appearance. All we know is half the story. What's the other half? If it's not outward, it's inward. So, and nobody knows the inwards, if that's a word, of somebody else. You know what you don't know? You don't know someone else's heart. We use expressions like that, I know. We say, well, they have a good heart. Well, we say that, but we don't know that. In fact, what, I, what, I, what, what we really have to remember is the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yet the truth be known, none of us have a good heart. Okay? All of our hearts are wicked and deceitful. But we, we, we pretend to know. Sometimes your people say, well, I know why they said that. You have, what you're trying to say is, I, I, I know what's in their heart. And you don't know what's in their heart. And, and sometimes, hey, I got news for you, sometimes you don't even know what's in your heart. Only God does. Because the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, what's the next phrase? Who can know it? And what's the answer to that? God. God, not even me. Not even me. That's why David would tell God, God, search my heart. You see if there be any wicked way in me. Because I, I'm not a good judge of that either. God, you search my heart. And I certainly, if I, if I can't even know my own heart, how am I going to know yours? And so i just going to, you know what we do? We just say, hey, you know what? I pray they're doing what God wants them to do. That's all. But I'll, I, I, I got my plate full just doing what God wants me to do. And I'm just going to make sure I'm doing what God wants me to do. We're in a race. Hebrews 12 says we're, we're running the race. I think Brother Booth talked about that with the weights and the sin that easily besets in the race. And any of you runners in here, did you run competitively in races? Anybody? Anybody? Got a couple of you here? Yeah. What's, what's one of the worst things you can do when you're running a race? Uh, all right. Look back. That's not good. Okay. And the Lord deals with that. You know something else you can't do? Look at the other. Don't look at the other runners. You start looking around to see where everybody else is, you know where they're going to be? Past you. Past you. And Jesus said, that's why Jesus said, when you run the race, we're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Who do you keep your eyes on as you run your Christian race? Jesus Christ. You've been saved any length of time at all. You know, you watch other runners, and you may, you listen, not only do they pass you, but listen, sometimes another runner stumbles and falls. And sometimes that'll get you off your race. You can't look at other runners. You can't look to other believers. You can't. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus. You have to keep your eyes focused on Him. You know why? He will never disappoint you. 
I think yeah, yeah, God gives you parents, God gives you pastors, God gives you teachers, and those are people you listen to and you look up to. But listen, if, if they're, they're human beings, they'll disappoint you. They can, they can they don't, 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 don't put them in the same place you put Jesus. No, you keep Jesus with the forefront that no matter what happens to anybody else, you'll keep looking at Jesus. That's vital in the race. So we run looking unto Jesus. Their works do follow them mean that what I do for Christ will be remembered. Their works do follow them means that I must not be a judge of others and what they're doing for God or not doing for God. Everybody, everybody has their own race to run. Our race in the Christian life is not a, is not a competition between each other. You understand? We're, we're just running the race God has for us. And Paul said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith he didn't say I finished the course there's not the course of the Christian life there's Paul said it's my course and and by the way God didn't have anybody else run the course Paul ran no one ever went through the things that Paul had to go through but but everybody is in it's individualized and it's your race and that's why you can't look at somebody else and say, well, wait, they should be doing this or they should be doing that. You know what? Just pray, Lord, I pray they're doing what you want them to do. That's it. Pray you're doing what you want them to do. And, and then, Lord, let's get back to me. Help me do what I'm supposed to be doing. And keep the focus on you and Christ. Number three, what does it mean that our works do follow them? It means I must purpose in my heart to serve God. This comes from Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. As the Hebrew children were taken captive into Babylon, and there were hundreds, if not thousands, of Hebrew young men. The Bible says they were, they were those that had uh, the ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So what they did was, when they came in in that first invasion, they took what we would call the cream of the crop. They took those who were going to be leaders. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted those, those young men first. And he took those young men out and, and he took them to Babylon and the first thing he did was he gave them all a Babylonian name. And, and then he wanted to give them the Babylonian diet. He was going to give them a Babylonian education too, by the way. But there were Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. You know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But, but, but the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat and the king's drink. I mean, Daniel, hey, hey, the other people, it doesn't mean that all those other guys who were there, it doesn't mean that they were they're awful guys. It just said, you know what? They never purposed in their heart they weren't going to do something. And so when the time came, they caved in. They did what everybody else was doing. And I want you to notice, when Daniel purposed in his heart to serve God, he became different. And his three friends purposed with him. And they became different than even all the other Hebrew captives. They weren't just different from the Babylonian boys. Sounds like a gospel quartet, doesn't it? And uh, the Babylonian boys in concert this Saturday. But um, they, they weren't just different from the Babylonian fellows. You know what? They were different from the Hebrew fellows too. And when you purpose in your heart to serve God, you understand something. You're not just going to be different from those who don't know Christ. You'll even be different from some who know Christ. But their, their passion in life is not to serve God. We have, we have churches. There's one in the southern part of Columbus now who used to, used to have, I think, six or eight bus routes, and they're, they're out of the bus ministry tonight because they've changed to to be a contemporary church. And you know why they had to leave the bus ministry? They don't have anybody to work it. Who wants to come out on a Saturday and spend three and four hours, four, five hours visiting a bus route? Not, not me. I want to come and be, be happy and clappy on Sunday for an hour and say, see you next Sunday. Me and Jesus are good. And listen, don't, don't, don't think that can't happen to you or me. If you don't purpose in your heart to serve God, it'll happen to you. 
can happen to me. And we just become those who come to church, sit in a chair on a Sunday, say, come on, preacher, entertain me, or people entertain me, or get a band in here and entertain me, and then uh, I'll see you next Sunday. And then I live any way I want during the week. And tell everybody, oh yeah, me and Jesus, we, we're okay, man. We, we got it going on. Purpose in your heart to serve God. Why do you have to purpose in your heart? Because the devil's out to stop you. You have an enemy. We have an enemy. And it's the devil. He'll use circumstances. He'll use relationships. He'll use a job. He'll use family members. He'll use other Christians to discourage you and get you to stop serving God. He doesn't care what it is just so you're not serving God. God has a will for your life. Satan does not have a specific will for your life. All he wants is that you don't do God's will for your life. It doesn't matter what else you do, just don't do that. Don't serve God with your life. And so you must purpose to keep serving God anyhow. Those people waiting in line, uh, saying things to those four men and criticizing those four men, I'm sure they heard it when the stuff started falling out of the ceiling. You know how much that costs? You's going to pay for that. You guys got money? Hmm? They just kept right on going. They got the job done. I wonder if, I wonder if other, other slaves, that little girl said, she's not going to listen to you. You're a slave girl. You're a captive. These Syrians aren't going to listen to what you have to say. Surely there had to be people there who were going to discourage her. I wonder if even some of the disciples told that little boy, hey, I appreciate it, uh, you know, Jonah or whatever little boy's name was, you know, thank you for bringing your lunch, but, you know, what, what's that among all these people? Hmm? That's what they said to Jesus. If they said that to Jesus, I suppose they would have said it to the little boy. I appreciate it there, fellow, but, man, this, this just isn't going to go far, very far in, in, in feeding all these people. Let me ask you a question tonight. How determined are you that your life would bring glory to God? How determined are you that your life will bring glory to God? Matthew chapter 5. Would you look there, please? Matthew chapter 5. Jesus' words in verse 16. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? See your what? And when they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We go back to what we said earlier. The reason they can bring glory to God is because they can only see. All man can see is your good works. Man can't see your faith. That's why James says, I'll have to show you my faith by my works. Because man can't see faith. God can see our faith. But man can't see faith. All we see is works. And man will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You know, How many of you played uh, sports? You played sport where you were on a team and you played sports with a team. Anybody like that? Quite a few of you. you know, I played, especially back in high school, even a little bit in college, but back when they had tryouts, they still have tryouts. Uh, you know, that's, that means some guys made the team and some guys didn't. Okay? It wasn't like everybody, everybody, we don't want to hurt anybody, not make team. No, either you were good enough or you weren't. And uh, you know what you did if you didn't make it? You said, work hard in your game, try to get on next year. Oh, well. Say, that, uh, that, that's the way it was. But you know, when you, suppose, you, suppose you get on the team. Let's say, let's say Danny Wright went out for the team, and he made the team. All right? But then you didn't show up for practice. And then Danny... Uh, didn't come to any of the team meetings. And then the first game came and Danny didn't show up for the game either. 
In fact, he didn't want anything to do with anybody on the team. In fact, he, we even saw him associating with some people from the other team. What would you conclude about Danny Wright? He must not really wanted to be on the team. Would that be accurate? Just by what you see? Hmm? Absolutely. You'd say you'd have to go to Danny and say, Danny, don't you want to be on the team? Oh yeah, man, I do. Yeah, I love being on the team. Well, you see, here's here's the situation. When you're on the team, that means you gotta come to practice. When you're on the team, it means that you gotta come to the meetings. When you're on the team, it means we go to the games together. And you're ready to play. When you're on the team, it means that you kind of hang out with the guys. And you, you get a camaraderie with one another. That's just goes with being on the team. You've been on teams. You know that's true. Can I help you with something? When you became a Christian, when you received Christ as your Savior, you were on the team. You made the team, the team of Christ. And you know what? It's kind of expected you come to practice. It's kind of expected that you be at the meetings. It's expected that you be ready to play in the game. It's kind of expected you like to hang out with other members of the team and, and get a camaraderie with the other members on the team. It's, 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 it, 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 that's what being on the team means seems to me there's a whole lot of Christians who think they're on the team, but you can never tell they're on the team because they're never at any of the games, they're never at the practice, they're never with the other guys on the team. In fact, I see them with the other team a lot. And I don't understand. Determine to serve God. Determine in your heart. Purpose in your heart to serve God. It's time, it's time for some of you to decide, I'm going to do something for God with my life. Because it's really, it's really come home to me with, with Terry's service yesterday. And, you know, it's just sometimes it's hard to believe that he, Terry Kaufman's not here anymore. Uh, 65 is not very old. Is that right, Don? Yeah, amen. And, and I'm serious. It, it, it isn't. And in this day and age, that's not, that's not old. And, you know, it, it, you wouldn't, five years ago, three years ago, you wouldn't have thought, Terry would be gone in 2017. But we don't know who will be gone in three more years. We don't know. Anybody here guaranteed tomorrow? I'm pretty sure I read the, I read the book and it said, boast not thyself of tomorrow. You know, not what a day can bring forth. I may not be here tomorrow. And so if, if that's the case, you know what? I, don't, don't always think, yeah, when, when, when this happens, I'm going to do something for God. When, when I get this, uh, then I'm going to do... No, you know what? devil will always have that carrot out in front of you. You'll never do something for God. Make your life count. Make your life count. Their works do follow them. It means what you and I do for God will be remembered. It means you and I are not in the business of judging others. It means that I must purpose in my heart to serve God. And their works do follow them. What works will follow you? Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And thank you, God, for this truth that you reminded us of, that our works follow us. And Lord, I realize what I think it was C.T. Studd who wrote the words that only one life so soon it will pass and only what's done for Christ will last. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight to realize we don't know when our last day will be. We don't know the day. Not only when we take our last breath, but we don't know the day we'll hear the trumpet sound and we'll hear the shout from heaven and we'll rise to meet you in the air. But God, we want to be doing the good works that you desire us to do. 
We want to do good works that folks can see and glorify our Father which is in heaven. We want to be zealous of good works. We want to be provoking one another unto good works. We realize you furnished us unto good works. So, Father, help us to be busy about your business while we're on this earth. Oh, may there be a group of people in Grove City, Ohio, who say my business is serving God. Only what I do for Christ will last. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. wonder here tonight and would say, Pastor, I, I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm a new creature in Christ. There's a time when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And Pastor, if I died tonight, I know that I'd wake up in heaven because I know that I'm trusting Jesus alone as my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you hold it up for a minute and say, that's me, Pastor. I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. Anybody here tonight would say, Pastor, I don't know. If I got a sharp pain through my chest tonight and I, I went into eternity, I don't know for sure if I'd wake up in heaven or hell. But Pastor, would you let me pray for you? No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to call you out, but I'll just remember you in prayer. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight? Somebody like that. God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Tonight, I'm speaking to believers. Their works do follow them. We need some men that say, my my business will be to serve God. We need some women to say, my business will be to serve God. We need some teenagers to say, my business will be to serve God. My works are going to follow me. Need some senior citizens that will say, my business is to serve God. I wonder how many folks tonight would say, preacher, that God has spoken to my heart. I want to do the good works that the Lord has ordained that I should walk in them. I want to be zealous of good works. I'm furnished unto good works. I, I want to do the works that my life would bring glory to God. Pastor, the Lord spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have your invitation. Listen carefully. When I'm done praying, we'll, the pianist will begin to play. Brother Bob will sing the invitation. If you slipped your hand up tonight and you said, I don't know where I'd go if I died, but I'd like to go to heaven. When, when we stand and the pianist plays and he sings, other people will be coming to pray at the altar. Would you just slip out and come to the front here and I'll meet you? We have people who take a Bible and they'll show you from the Bible how you can know you're on your way to heaven. You can walk out the door in a few minutes with the peace of God in your heart that you know if anything happens, you're going to wake up in heaven. You'll, you'll have eternal life. When others are coming, you slip out and come. And we'll have someone take a Bible and share with you. Best news you ever heard in your life. Christian, God has spoken to your heart. You obey him this evening. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for hands have been uplifted, indicating that you have dealt with them. I pray, Lord, for the believer who needs to come and to pray and that you'll be glorified in our lives. And I pray for those who slipped their hand up and said they, they'd like to know that when they die, they'll go to heaven. And I pray, Lord, they'll come. Let someone take a Bible. Show them how they can know Christ as their Savior. Father, have your way in every heart and life now in this invitation. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. You come this evening. Will you please? Have I done That's my right. Best for Jesus, who died upon that cruel tree, to think of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. 
How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus since he has done so much for me. The hours that I have wasted are so many. The hours I've spent for Christ so few. Because of all my lack of love for Jesus, I wonder if his heart is breaking too. How many are the souls that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus since he has done so much for me. I wonder have I cared enough for others or have I let them die alone? I might have helped a wanderer to the Savior, the seed of precious life I might have sown. How many are the souls that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus since he has done so much for me. No longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many the are the lost them, that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus since he has done so much for me. Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would endeavor to walk in the works that you've ordained for us to walk in, that others would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And Lord, we know that any good works we do is because you work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And we want to do those works, Lord, not in our power, but in your power. And I pray you'd give us the ability to do that and keep us focused on Jesus and focused on what you'd have us to do. And I pray we would impact the world in which we live for Jesus Christ. Father, dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. And I pray others would see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? Here we go. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.